So we're trying to equip our parents, educate our parents. So then hopefully this education will lead them to then engage and back into our schools. And then we can say the doors of our schools are open huh? and re-engage them. COVID did all schools a disservice uh, in terms of parental engagement. And we need to, it is our responsibility as educational organizations to re-engage not only our parents, but our community into educational process and work together to make this a one team effort. You're listening to the smartsocial.com podcast. I'm your host, Josh Oaks. This is our district talk segment where we interview district leaders to learn how they're keeping students safe on social media so those students can someday shine online. Now, let's get back to the interview. I'm Don Austin, Superintendent of Schools for the Palo Alto Unified School District. We have 18 school sites serving about 10,300 students in the city of Palo Alto, home of Stanford University. So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Angel Rivera. I'm the superintendent of Mesquite ISD, a uh, little suburb of Dallas, south corner of south Dallas. We have 52 schools in our district, and we serve 38,353 students. All right. So uh, my name is Jason Perez, and I am the superintendent for Deer Creek Public Schools, which is located in Edmond, Oklahoma, which is just outside of Oklahoma City. Uh, we have nine school sites, and that scan spans over 72 square miles with a little over 7,600 students. How have you been successful in increasing parent engagement to help keep students safe on social media? That's been a hard one. Um, we are actually putting together an ad hoc committee currently about parent education specifically around uh, the way students communicate with each other and, and gather information. And as we look at uh, some new advances, things I was even watching this morning about how artificial intelligence could impact the next presidential election, including how they do their media, their commercials, how they generate things that aren't even true or, or real. Uh, it's, it's really important for our students and families to have those discussions at home, not just in the school classroom, and, and to educate our parents who, who here in the Silicon Valley, there's a chance they're creating this technology. Uh, but there's also a segment of our population that's oblivious to it. And, and it's important that they at least know the basics, where to look, uh, what, what things might be out there that could be harmful for their, their own children or their families. So one of the things that, and I will say, this is one of the areas, this is a, it's a prime priority for our district. It's a complete priority, and I'm shifting responsibilities in our school district to, to address this. Because before COVID, we did a great job at connecting our parents. We did an amazing job at bringing them in, engaging them, getting them involved in the educational process. And then COVID happened in 2020. And unfortunately, whether it was by legislators, whether it was by politics, whatever, we told them to go away. Don't call us. We'll call you. And then after COVID was over and it was declared that the pandemic was over, we said, hey, our doors are open. Come back. Well, what those two and a half years did was created a, I, I like to call it a, a wall between our parents and our schools. And we recognize that now. And so we're doing a very strategic effort to bring them back. For example, we're, we're, next month, we're holding our first safety summit. And in our safety summit, we're going to talk about school safety, social media safety, weapons safety, because if you follow in the news, also fentanyl awareness, because if you follow in the news, there is a big, uh, there, there, there's a huge intake of fentanyl in our youth because probably the parents do not understand what that is. So we're trying to equip our parents educate our parents. So then hopefully this education will lead them to then engage and back into our schools. And then we can say the doors of our schools are open huh? and re-engage them. COVID did all schools a disservice uh, in terms of parental engagement. And we need to, it is our responsibility as educational organizations to re-engage not only our parents, but our community into educational process and work together to make this a one team effort. And this is something that, that we're hearing more from parents that they want more information on. <clears throat> and so 
I, I want to reference again a program like BARC that we use, which is a safety protocol program that we use district-wide, but also has options where parents can also purchase those same sort of protections uh, at a low cost or sometimes even no cost, depending on the partnerships that the districts have. Uh, things like that can really help out families of various socioeconomic levels. Um, but in addition, our recent attempts at doing like parent nights, uh, and having more offerings in the future for parents to come to the school sites and really learn more about how to manage technology, monitor social media, uh, do all those things within the family uh, can really make a big difference. We have great partnerships with our law enforcement and with social workers and even with some of our local universities too that they'll provide presentations on the topic. It's always surprising to me uh, how many parents when their students are like in big trouble with social media type things that they were just completely oblivious to just how engaged their kids were in these different platforms and aren't aware of discord and they weren't aware that their kids have more than one account. I, I always hate that for them because they're, they're like, oh, if I had only known this stuff before, I could have prevented this from happening. And, uh, and so it's really just trying to push out as many of those opportunities for parents to get that information because they can't be the masters of everything, uh, but we do have a lot of great community partners that can help them along. Yeah, excellent tips. You're right. Are there any stories that come to mind about any social media incidents you may have been able to get in front of or avoid by being proactive? Well, yeah. So, so we work pretty closely with Stanford University. Stanford University's communication department uh, gave me some numbers that were really important. Instead of something that's posted and it's inaccurate or hurtful online, if you can't get to that and correct it in six minutes, you've missed the opportunity. So if you can't get there in six minutes, then spend a little longer and do a really thorough, better job of, of getting back um, in, in front of misinformation. We've really held true to that. If we can correct something instantly, we do, which is rare in a school district. Uh, but more often than not, we are behind um, on things like uh, your crisis situation. Another piece of advice from, from Stanford that we really uh, took to heart is don't wait for the full story to feel like you can post something. If you're waiting until you have every detail, you've missed the opportunity to get in front of the initial announcement, and it's better to give a bite-sized piece of something. For example, there's an, there's an incident, an issue on school campus, your students are safe, but as a precaution, we've had to lock down campus while the police come in and we can ensure that everything is what we believe it to be. More information will be coming later. That's much more effective than waiting 20 minutes to get more information and write people after the fact. And I think that's, that's a real difference between the old school approach of you wait until you have everything and you send something nice and packaged to now get a bite size out there so people cannot accuse you of hiding or, or uh, having to react to misinformation, which beats you to the punch. So we've had a few um, social media incidents in terms of safety. Yes, uh, we, we, we have several platforms that monitor uh, the usage of, of our media services, everything they come in. And so students are able to post things on there and we, we monitor it and are able to then work together where there is the police and actually we averted what we think you know it's it's hard to prove that something didn't happen because of this but suicides prevention we've we've actually been able to engage and, and prevent kids that been involved in in, in suicide uh, ide ideology and thoughts that we we believe that they probably would have tried and attempted suicide if we did not intervene and that because of social media and what we monitor, but also school safety in terms of uh, weapons that the kid might have had, might have possessed and had a vendetta or a list. And so we were able to engage through social media, track it down to the IP address, engage the police and been able to prevent or at least address that and address the mental state of the individual, getting them help with wraparound services. And I believe that we probably prevented something in our schools that it might have been cause some casualties, yes. So, I mean, in, in general, we really work hard to build relationships with our students uh, so that 
and, and I think it's beginning to pay off where they're often reporting incidents to us before they get out of hand. Um, in our younger grades, parents report social media concerns to us as well. Um, our district uses uh, a program called Stop It, and we train our students in grades 4 through 12 on how to use it, which is basically it's an anonymous report line that they can uh, submit if they are concerned about self-harm or bullying that they see with their peers. And often these reports really help us get ahead of an issue before it actually happens or it becomes worse. Uh, students are, are really good. They know how to be able to grab screenshots and upload that into those programs, which helps us. I, I, it's immense the amount of help that that offers, and it really has helped us in several situations throughout the school year. What would your advice be to educators and administrators to work together to create a culture of digital safety and responsibility in their school? Well, yeah, I think first is modeling. I use myself as an example. If I'm, if I'm out, uh, you know, blasting away or posting inappropriate content or using foul language, then how can I possibly come back and be the model for a school district? I think teachers need to understand uh, not, not just teachers, but anyone associated with the school needs to understand, well, you have First Amendment rights. You also have a responsibility to be a professional. If you have a professional account or a blended account, a blended account needs to be treated as professional. So it needs to start there. And then going back and helping students to see how whatever they post or interact with online is forever is important. And, you know, I, I've had to tell my own kids, Look, because you think something is acceptable with your peer group and and maybe even a, an age or two above your peer group, you have to remember that somewhere else there's somebody else that somewhere else there's somebody 55 years old who's sitting there evaluating that through very different eyes. So it's important to remember that your audience, you know, one of the first things we teach kids is when you're speaking or you're giving a presentation, know your audience. When you're posting online, your audience could very well be everybody. That's a pretty tough group to nail down as, a, as an audience that's all going to read or or interpret something the same way. I think this is a thing that um, this is an issue that we need to work together. Um, and and when I say work together, I think we're, we're I think we're smarter together than separate. Uh, and I, I will I will love to get together with other superintendents and CTOs instructional technology folks and create a coalition that says, hey, this is the best practice. This is how we rolled it out and create a how-to because educators are either natural, skilled at integrating technology or they're not. And this applies also to leaders. Every superintendent that I know, at least 99% of them were teachers that moved their way along the path. We're not experts in technology. So uniting all the experts together and saying, okay, what are the best practices to infuse this into educational design? You start with the end in mind with the design, build it into the curriculum as a byproduct of the integration of the learning and not see it as something separate. Until we do that, we're not going to make headways with it, nor are we going to move the majority of our students in the right direction towards that what I call productive digital citizenship, where you're actually using and leveraging social media to make your point across in terms of learning, in terms of capacity development, in terms of leadership development. We undervalue a lot of the leadership development in our schools because a lot of people think that leadership is either innate and it cannot be learned. I argue that anybody can lead if you're passionate about what you're doing, hence the AI program that I've talked about before. If I'm passionate about what we're doing, I can lead in that endeavor. But if I'm not passionate, I'm not going to lead. But if you, if you tap into everybody's genius, they're able to be leaders in X. And fortunately or unfortunately, wherever you stand, social media and all the technologically advances can, leverage, can be leveraged to accomplish that. But together, right? We all need to come in together because we're smarter together than individually. You know, so, some of the things that we're doing right now would be like we have monthly meetings with some of our technology teachers, um, th those people that are the experts within the, the school um, 
and and we're working on things with being able to look at like where some of the pain points are, some of the successes are, and and try to be able to make all of this work collaboratively. Um, but it's a, it's an ongoing process. It's something that like I don't think you could ever just be stagnant and kind of say we've got this down pat. Uh, now we just get to kick back and relax because technology changes so quickly. We have to be willing to stay up with it and change along with it, which can be really really hard. In, in the school setting where we are limited in our access to funds and we can't always have the latest and greatest in, in, in protection and in technology that we kind of have to work with what we have and, uh, and just have some really dedicated people in the wings helping us out. What are your one to two biggest social media concerns for the future? Number one is you know, after, after watching some shows on the, on the topic, the fact that programmers are designing app to be addictive. So knowing that that is a primary focus and primary goal of some of the apps that are being created, TikTok is a perfect example. Uh, the idea that students can drift away into mindless activities that have no benefit but are completely addictive is a is a major concern. Yeah, you know, number two, I, I embracing the world of AI, but it's not without its own issues. I think that, uh, you know, as we look in the future here, it's going to be harder and harder to discern where a threat comes from or is originated, or is somebody who's portraying themselves as somebody actually that person, or is this something completely uh, made up and done through an artificial intelligence that, that we're not going to be able to tell the difference of. So, those, those are probably number one and two right now. My social media concerns are pretty much uh, some of the things that I've been alluding to in my responses is where people do not, uh, they're seeing social media as a, as a venue to do negative things. And, and they don't, and then the other one is people don't see the value and the power in how social media can be leveraged to accomplish organizational goals. Two of our biggest challenges, uh, you know, one of them I want to talk about is interactions between students and adults that cannot be monitored. Uh, this can be really scary because there are so many ways for students and adults to interact with each other. There's, there's so many different options available to them. And if we don't know it's happening, we can't intervene. And so the ease in which students can find material that's harmful, whether that's violent material, pornography, or just completely false information that's taken as the truth, uh, it, that's very scary that that's out there. Um, another thing is parents are, they're feeling pressure from their children at increasingly younger ages to purchase smartphones and smart watches. And it's kind of that whole, all of my friends have one and the kids are not prepared to be able to handle the exposure that kind of comes with that technology at an elementary age. And then, as I mentioned before, we have some parents that are not equipped to really safely monitor uh, those devices to the level needed for younger children. Social media and, and digital exposure is not developmentally appropriate for elementary students, and we're seeing the negative effects of this exposure uh, being reflected in our school environments. Yeah, so well said. We're, we're behind you 100%. Okay, last question for you. Funding is difficult these days. What advice would you give to other districts to secure funding to create resources that parents need? Well, I think first of all, uh, there's enough money to do anything you want, but not everything. So you need to be really judicious about where you're putting your dollars. And, and, and you, to the best of everyone's ability, you don't have to be so cutting edge that you're on the bleeding edge. Right. But you also can't look at technology through a 1980s or 90s lens. If you're still building computer labs uh, to rotate students through, you've missed. Uh, I, I'm not even sure how long one to one device is going to be the, the best place to, to, to sink money. So I think you need to look through it through a future lens and ask students how they're using the technology. Uh, it's something I just did with some of our high school students, uh, just a small group setting with 25 students. And some of what they told me was no surprise. Some of what they told me was so shocking. I had to make sure my mouth didn't drop open. And so uh, I think, again, just asking the consumer, 
how they're they're using. I think in this particular space, our students are better positioned to tell us how they learn and what devices are are aiding them than our teachers. And so I think partnerships is the answer for this. There's a lot of uh, and and I just told you we were doing uh, a campaign to re-engage our parents. Well, I've reached out to the city. I'm reaching out to federal organizations to see what resources are available to get us there. There's there's actually a lot of resources available. I put one of my uh, community people in charge of this, and we actually have a meeting coming up next week. But there's a lot of um, organizations I partner up. I know I already garnished the partnership of our city, the city of Mesquite. We have a really good partnership. And a lot of school districts do not work well with their cities. I will challenge them to actually build that bridge because they're there is a lot of power in both the city and the school district working together to accomplish what I like to call making our city a better place. And we, unfortunately, we have that partnership, but look at federal grants, look at um, uh, some other sources of, of, of revenue. But if all fails, I think you need to look at prioritization of your goals and the current funding that you have. And we did this. We looked at return investment of the, thing, of the programs we currently carry and said, well, this is not really yielding the results. Educators tend to get attached to programs and things that we do because we've done it forever. But if we look at it from a business mindset and say, am I getting the return on investment of this program? If the answer is no, explain the why, slowly pull the Band-Aid and utilize those funds to yield the result that you want on another area that might have a higher prioritization or a higher need. You know, I don't think people really realize how expensive everything is. You know, when you're in a, in a household and you're making that decision to buy an iPad, that's one iPad. When you're in a school district where you may be changing hundreds or thousands of iPads, you know, uh, it, it gets really expensive really quick. Um, our techs, our IT techs, uh, they can easily go out in there and double their salary in the private sector. This is something else we have to consider, too, is that... Um, they can go out there and ma make so much money. We need that expertise here in the schools. And so these are things we have to consider, you know, and when we think about like at a minimum cost of like a device for a student, I mean, that's roughly over $300 per student, but each one of those has a platform that we have to have like a, a light speed or a canvas or any of those things that either provide protection on the device or provide a learning management systems or a content management system. Those come at, a, at additional cost too. So you have that base cost for the device, but then you have the additional subscription costs on top of it that are usually around $5 a student at a minimum per item. Um, it, it adds up really quickly. Networking equipment is also re very expensive, even when you're using your E-rate uh, to help kind of offset that cost. And then cybersecurity <laughs> is another huge cost uh, where if we're breached as a school district, I mean, that's a large cost that, that we are constantly trying to work on monitoring and try to contain those small breaches so we don't have a big one that can really cost us large amounts of money that then we have to pull away from academics, pull away from staffing, pull away from security. Um, these, are, these are the obstacles that we run into as we move into this tech, technological age. And uh, I wish I had a good answer on how to be able to overcome that because I feel like I'm just bringing up the problem rather than the solution. But these are the things that we are facing right now um, and that we'll continue to face as we move down this pathway because we need to move down this pathway. Uh, after the pandemic, it really showed that as a whole in education, we were not taking the use of technology as serious as we should have. Uh, and so now we all had to play catch up at a time where we really weren't prepared. So now that we moved beyond that pandemic, we have to take those lessons and really progress forward because this is where we're moving as, as a society. This is the way that our students learn. This is the way that they interact and communicate. And we can't force them to go back to the overhead projectors and the worksheets when they're ready to move on to that next phase. Thanks for listening to our smartsocial.com podcast. I'm your host, Josh Oaks. This was our district talk segment where we interview school district leaders to learn how they're keeping students safe on social media so those students can someday launch into their future by shining online. This episode was brought to you by our smartsocial.com VIP program. It's called the Very Informed Parent Program, which helps you engage your students with teen-led video lessons. 
Stay one step ahead with our premium parent newsletter and discover hidden features on trending apps on teens' phones and our 54 plus live parent and student friendly events every single year. You can click on the link below to chat with one of our team members if you want a free pass to our VIP program to support your community with our smartsocial.com resources. And if you're a district leader who has a success story, we would love to feature you on a future episode. You can click the links below to reach out. Thanks so much for listening, and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Have a great day.